PID math demystified. Most process control engineers have been exposed to the basic equation in a form that looks something like this. Pretty scary, but let's break it down into smaller components. Output is equal to the proportional plus the integral plus the derivative components. In an industrial controller, you may have a combination of some or all of the components. So let's start with the simplest component first, the proportional only controller. For a proportional only controller, the equation becomes output equals gain times error. I prefer to use pseudocode to better illustrate how these controllers work than trying to fight through the math. First, the error is simply the set point minus the process value, how far you are from where you want to be. The output is then this error times a factor k, which is commonly called gain. To visualize this controller in action, let's imagine that a proportional controller is driving a car. The output of the controller sets the position of the gas pedal. We are going to define the output of this controller as the angle theta, and further define that when theta is equal to zero, the pedal is slightly depressed. So when the theta is equal to zero, the car travels 25 miles per hour. But we want to travel 55 miles per hour. So that becomes our set point. And the initial error can be visualized as the distance on our speedometer between how fast we are currently moving and how fast we want to go. So if the graph at the top displays the car's speed, or process variable, and the lower graph shows theta, the angle of the gas pedal, we can trace the action of the controller. Initially, with theta at zero, the car is traveling 25 miles per hour. We want to speed up to 55 miles per hour, so that is our set point. This large error is the distance between these two. This large error, when multiplied by the gain, causes theta to increase substantially, depressing the gas pedal. This causes the car to speed up. On the next scan, since the car is moving at a faster speed, the error is now considerably smaller. Since the error is smaller, when it is multiplied by the gain, the output decreases, causing the foot to lift off the gas. This, in turn, causes the car to slow down, which again increases the error. If the gain is too large, this oscillation will continue to grow with the pedals slamming down and releasing. Any control loop can be made unstable if the gain is too large, but tuning, finding the right gain, is another topic. If the gain is not too large, theta and the car speed will eventually stabilize at a speed somewhere below the set point. Surprised? Did you think the whole point of the controller was to get the car going 55 miles an hour? Well, it is and it isn't. We'll discuss the merits of proportional control later. For now, it's more important to understand how the controller works than why. If you look at the pseudocode, it's clear that for theta to be anything other than zero, there has to be some error. This steady state error, or distance from set point, is often called the offset. If you want to close this gap or eliminate the offset, that's where typically the integral component comes in. So we'll discuss it next. For a proportional integral controller, or PI controller as it's called, we add integral to the equation. Now the math is starting to get scary. From high school calculus, you might think, OK, I can handle an integral. All I need to do is find the area under the curve of the area over time, of the error over time. But wait, what do I do if I can't predict the error is going to be? The good news is that there's a simpler way of looking at an integral. While a proportional com component is only affected by the error at that instant, the integral is an accumulation. As long as the error exists, each scan, a little more of that error is added to the pile. The next thing that you may notice is that there are two gains, k sub p and k sub i, but your typical industrial controller only has one gain and a time constant for the integral. This is because the dependent form of the equation is more common in industrial controllers than the independent form that we've been using so far. So instead of two factors, k sub p and k sub i, we define one parameter, k, called the gain, that gets multiplied into both proportional and integral components. Add another parameter, tau sub i, that only applies to the integral component. While the gain is dimensionless, tau sub i has units something like seconds per repeat. What's repeating, and what does this have to do with time? Well, 
let's say you have an integral time constant tau sub i of 5 seconds per repeat. If the error stays the same, then each scan, the proportional component will be the gain times the error, but it doesn't change. But the accumulator will increase by one-fifth the amount of each scan. So if the scan rate is once per second, the proportional component will repeat every five seconds. To explain how this works, let's look at the pseudocode for this controller. The calculation of error is the same as before. The summation that replaced the integral is stored in a variable called reset. In practice, this is sometimes called the reset register. The output is now equal to the same proportional component as before, plus this reset. Let's look at our example from before. We have the same car, the same theta, and the same speed. But this time, we will add a graph of the accumulated error in the reset register. We begin with the same error. This error, multiplied by the gain, is the same proportional component value. This value is divided by tau sub i and added to the reset register. This reset register is added to the output along with the same proportional component from before, causing the output to increase and speeding up the car. Again, this, de this decreases the error. This smaller error then contributes a small increase to the reset register. This new reset register value is added to the output with the current proportional component, which results in the output decreasing and the car slowing down, which again increases the error. This error contributes an increase to the reset register. This new reset register value is added to the output with the current proportional component. Notice that as time goes on, the proportional component oscillates as it did before, but the integral component continues to rise as long as the process variable is below the set point. Over time, the reset register will accumulate enough so that the car speed reaches the desired set point. It is interesting that at this point, the proportional component has been a reset to zero, which is likely the origin of the term. Now is a good time to talk about the units of these parameters. Gain is generally considered dimensionless because it is related to percentage change in output divided by percentage change in error. Alternatively, it can be expressed as proportional band, which is a percentage range, in that case divided into the error instead of multiplied. But this is only typical for older control systems. So for our code, we'll stick with gain. Tau sub i is referred to as the integral time constant and can be in units of repeats per minute or seconds per repeat, depending on whether it is multiplied or divided into the gain. The pseudocode assumes that gain is dimensionless and tau sub i is in seconds per repeat. But what does seconds per repeat even mean? If we think of a case where the error is not changing, for example, you are pressing down the pedal, but the car is out of gas, the error will stay the same and the proportional component of the output will be constant. Say, for example, this causes you to depress the pedal 5 degrees. If in the example, tau sub i is 10 seconds per repeat, every 10 seconds, the pedal will be depressed another 5 degrees. In other words, it will be 10 seconds per repeat of the initial proportional kick. So you may be wondering why you need proportional at all if the integral component will get you to the set point. Sometimes you don't. If you want a very slow, steady rise to a set point change, an integral-only controller can be acceptable. But for a controller that you want to quickly get moving in the right direction, the proportional kick for a large error can be very beneficial. Because of this, most controllers in industry or PI controllers. The next controller is the proportional derivative controller. To investigate how derivative action works, let's look at a PD controller. PID controllers are far more common than PID controllers are far more common than PD alone, but we already have an understanding of the integral component's effect, so we don't need to review it again. For a proportional derivative controller, we add the derivative of the error into the equation. Similar to the previous discussion, we're not really interested in deriving a derivative of the error function. Consequently, the derivative in this case refers to how fast the error is changing. So if we take the change in error divided by the change in time, we get the slope. 
To explain how this works, let's look at the pseudocode for this controller. The calculation of the error is the same as before. Since the derivative reduces down to the change in error, the output is now the same proportional component as before, gain times error. The current error minus the last error is multiplied by the gain and, and divided by the derivative time constant. The current error is then stored in last error for use in the next scan. So what does this mean? The proportional component is affected by the error at that time or in the present. As we saw before, the integral component is, is affected by an accumulation of the error in the past. But the derivative component is a measure of how fast the error is changing or a prediction of what the error is going to be in the future. How is this prediction of the future used? At first glance, you might think that this term would be used to get you to the set point that much faster. In practice, the derivative term is used to detect when the process variable is changing too fast, and it puts the brakes on to prevent overshooting the set point. Let's look at our car example again. But this time, instead of a single car, imagine a car hitched to a heavy load. This increases the mass of the car and makes it harder to get it going. We will again use the same definition of theta and the same definition of error as before. Again, the car is initially traveling at 25 miles per hour and the set point is at 55 miles an hour. We will use the same graph for theta representing the proportional component and how far the gas pedal is depressed. And we also introduce a new graph, D, representing the derivative term. Just as in the previous example, the initial error is large. The proportional component of the error is, therefore, also large. The slope at this point is flat, so the derivative component is zero. Theta is the addition of these components, and again the gas pedal is pressed down. Because of the large mass of the car and trailer combination, the car increases speed, but only a small amount initially. On the next scan, since the car speed has only increased slightly, the error is still large. This again results in a large proportional component. Since the car has not sped up much at this point, the slope of the error is still small, which results in a small derivative component having little effect on theta. But now the car is beginning to pick up steam, and on the next scan, the error is now smaller, which results in a smaller proportional component. The derivative component calculates that the car's rate of speed is increasing by the fact that the slope of the error has increased. This increased slope results in an increased derivative term. This derivative term then reduces theta to the point that the pedal is released. This prevents the car from getting too much momentum and overshooting the set point. This reduction in theta, combined with the momentum of the car and trailer, results in a speed closer to the set point, but not necessarily exceeding it. The derivative component is then again reduced as the change in the error is reduced, and so on. So if the derivative component acts as brakes on the momentum, how does it get you to set point faster? It does this by allowing you to use a high, higher proportional gain to get you there quickly, but dampening the overshoot that would normally make that gain unstable. The tuning constants for derivative control are typically the same units as the time constant for reset. A couple of other considerations though are important. On many controllers, the derivative term is filtered independently. This prevents signal noise or spurious disturbances from being interpreted as a change in momentum. Also, on some controllers, the derivative does not actually derive from the error, but instead on the process variable signal alone. This prevents a change in set point from being seen as a change in momentum. So now we've looked at each of the components. I hope that the equation is a little less intimidating. You've seen that the output is the sum of the proportional, integral, and derivative components. It's the combination of the error that the controller is seeing right now, plus what it has accumulated in the past, and in what it predicts for in the future. I hope this helps demystify the math, at least a little.